Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the second of the Chibi Tracks programming tutorials in which we're looking at my music player, Chibi Tracks, which is part of the Unholy Trilogy, as I called it, the um, Chibi Sound Pro, which is the platform specific driver, Chibi Tracks, which is the multi platform music player, which is a retro player, so it's on the Z80 in this case, also 6502-68000, plan for more systems later, and my Chibi Tracker Pro, which is a Windows application for writing the music. So today we're going to look at the Chibi Tracks player on the Z80, so this is multi-platform code. We're going to go through the basics of the program, the introduction part, which reads in the header of the file and initializes for the playing. We're going to look at the playing part in a later lesson. So that's what we're going to go over today. So let's go over the source code and let's take a look at what we've got. So the first thing we're going to discuss is the layout of the actual memory that Chibi Tracker uses. Now, Chibi Tracker does need some bytes of memory for its configuration. Basically, it defines one block per channel. Now in the default configuration it uses three channels so this is one block for each of the three channels. Now the blocks are 16 bytes in size but not all of the bytes are used and these define the current settings for the channel. So um, you'll see here I've got these remmed out sections here. The reason they're remmed out is because ChibiTracks is designed to be pointed to a block of memory and it will reset and configure that memory as required. So this is sort of a template for testing purposes but it's not what's actually used when the program is used itself. What we've got here is one of the blocks for one of the channels and each of the channels works independently of the others. So I mean, in theory we could have more channels, it shouldn't be too difficult to get set up. So here is the sort of template. Now we have some bytes that are passed to the Chibi Sound Pro routine. There are four bytes um, passed to Chibi Sound Pro. There is two bytes that are the frequency, one byte that is the volume and one byte which is the channel number and noise state. And these are sort of represented here. We've, in this case, we've got the first byte here is the note number. So this would be read in from the um, octave lookup table. One of the entries in that would be used. We then have the volume, 0 to 255, with 255 being the loudest. And we then have the channel and noise state. Now this is 0 for the first channel, 1 for the second channel, and 2 for the third channel, and so on. And the top bit of that would be set to 1 if the noise was on. In this case, it's being defaulted to off, of course. Now, this byte is different to all of the others because we need to set this up correctly for the channel number for Chibi um, tracks to work correctly when, when the program starts. If they were all set to 0, all of the sound channels would be piped through to the single channel on the actual hardware, and the music wouldn't play properly. So that's um, quite important. We then have a pitch shift. This is used for pitch bending, and so that's... What that's therefore we have an instrument address now this is a um, word which is pointing to the entry in the playing instrument script for the next line that needs to be processed we then have a um, timeout for the current line this is a counter that goes down when it reaches zero the next line of the instrument needs to be processed so this is, goes hand in hand with the word above that timeout there which is set to one in this example here now um, we then have the pattern address which is the pointer to the line of the pattern which is um, next to play we have a pattern timeout which is the number of ticks left for the current line of the pattern when that reaches zero the next line of the pattern is read in and as i said before instrument script and pattern script are basically the same format and are literally handled by the same program code within this routine although we're not going to look at that this time we i think we're going to look at that next time so we'll see that next time. And we then have a sequence address, which is a pointer to the current line of the sequence. These are bytes which represent pattern numbers. There is no timeout for the sequence because the sequence ends when the current playing pattern tells the code to update the sequence. There's a special byte command within the patterns that tells the um, player to start loading in the next pattern from the sequence. So there's no timeout for that. And the remaining four bytes there are completely unused. So on the Z80, this is a 16 byte block. It's larger on the 68000, but on the 8 bit systems, it's a 16 byte block. And so we have a channel data length here defined as 16 and the channel data length total is defined as 16 times 3 so 48 there so that is the amount of data that Chibi Tracks needs to handle the actual playing channels. There's a few of the bytes that are needed. These need to be defined somewhere in memory. So here we, you can see I've defined them. We've got a song offset. This is used for relocatable songs. When the song is exported as a binary, it's exported with a memory address it should be loaded into, for example, memory address 1000. But if we want to load it into a different address on an alternate system, maybe 1000 is good on the CPC, on the spectrum, that's a ROM area, so we might need to load it to 8,000. Well, um, the code can cope with that, but it needs to calculate an offset. 
So that is what that is for. The base is the address that the song has actually been loaded into, and that is where the song will be played from. So that needs to be loaded with the correct value. Instrument list and pattern list, these are calculated pointers to the instruments and patterns within the song data. The song channels is a count that will always be three in the current format. Song speed is for if the speed of the song needs to be changed, it will be loaded in when the song is loaded, but you can actually change it if you want. And the repeat point, this is also loaded in from the header. Um, if we look at the song, you will be able to see basically the channels is being loaded in from this first byte here. The repeat point is loaded in from the second byte. Song speed will be loaded in from that third byte. The song load address is my song there, and that would be used to calculate the offset. We have the pattern list and the instrument list, and those are loaded in to those byte memory addresses here, instrument list and pattern list. Now, originally I was actually calculating those um, in real time every time, loading them in from the um, source data of the header, but that was going to be inefficient for processing power. And I figured that two bytes of memory was a very, very small amount to sacrifice for the increased speed. So that is what we've done. So that is the format of the um, channels and the other data that's needed. And we have a series of um, symbols defined here for the various bytes of data within the channel that we might want to alter. And we've got offsets here, which represent the byte offsets within this sort of template of data. However, we don't actually use any kind of templates of data like this. We will just define our channel data as a pointer to this chibi sound ram as we call it here so the address of this chibi sound ram is different on every system on the 8-bit systems you really only need to allocate about 128 bytes as you saw there the first 48 bytes are used for the three channels um, then there's a few bytes being used for the other configuration data of chibi tracks itself and the other thing is uh, there are some bytes that are used by the platform specific sound drivers that will also be um, where possible loaded into this chibi sound ram so if you're 128 bytes you should be okay I tend to allocate 256 I'm not trying to squeeze everything that tight but as I say it, it doesn't need much memory at all and the actual player itself does run from ROM you saw it's running from the Sega Master System earlier it works from ROM that is a part of the design of this software I wanted software that would work from ROM because I'm using systems like the Game Boy where that's where that is a limitation and the MSX as well so there's no self-modifying code in what you see here now there are some player options which can be enabled to increase functionality or disabled to save some memory. Now the first one of these is the allow speed change. Now allow speed change will allow you to change the music's playing speed at, at playback time. So a play speed of five will be slower than a play speed of one, which would, well, a play speed of one would basically mean that it was being updated every single um, interrupt. Play speed of five would, uh, would slow it down by five there. Now this is actually an optional setting. Now this is the Chibi Akamas theme in Chibi Tracker. So this is the song that you heard earlier and the song speed of this is five, which means that each of the ticks on, on this list here is actually five ticks of the running processor. Now, what you can do is rather than have the um, playing software actually calculate those speed changes using allow speed change, you can disable this line here, which will disable the player from working out the speeds and you can pre-multiply the song speed here, which basically in, instead of saving a, a delay of one per line or two if there's an unused line there, it will multiply that by the uh, actual playback speed. So the playback speed of five would mean that a, de a delay that's shown here of two because there's two lines there. There's, a, there's, a, there's an unused line between the used lines, so there's a delay of two between the lines. That would be multiplied by five and the delay would be saved as 10 in the binary. So that would mean that you could disable the allow speed change function but the um, downside of that would be you wouldn't really be able to change the speed of playback if you've got systems that you need to manually override the playback speed for whatever reason maybe you've got a 60 hertz system and a 50 hertz system you want to tweak the speed a little bit you can't do that if you've disabled allow speed change but you will save a little bit of speed and also memory within the player because that will disable parts of the routine allow re relocation is the same when we export as a binary file you've got this setting here and the song load address here it's zero because um, I'm actually I'm actually using this as an assembly but if you're using it as a binary and you are allowing relocation it really doesn't matter what the song load address is specified as however if you disable allow relocation um, it definitely does matter and the song load address must be the address you're actually loading it in at so if you've got the file being loaded into memory address 8000 you'd better make sure song load address 
address is set to 8000. If allow relocation is disabled, if allow relocation is enabled, it really makes no difference whatsoever what the load destination is. So um, those are some functions that we can enable or disable depending on our requirements. Now, um, these have some routines here that are used as subroutines. So I've put them at the top here, so we can discuss them first. So allow relocation here, what it's basically just doing is loading in the calculated song offset. And in this case, it's adding it to DE. So DE is being offset by the song offset, which is the calculation of the discrepancy between the song's load address and its binary compile address. So that's compensating for that and allowing us to load to any memory address on the system. Allow speed change here. This is a very simply mu simple multiplication routine and it's basically multiplying the value in the accumulator by the song speed. And this is used for the pattern playback speed. It's not used by the instruments. It, doesn't, it wouldn't actually work correctly for the instruments, but it's used for the patterns to allow the patterns to be played slower or faster. So that's what we're doing there. And we're loading in the song speed that has been loaded in from the header and basically just using it through a very crude multiplication routine here to multiply the value in C. And we're using this as a very crude multiplication routine to effectively multiply the value that was passed in A by the value in song speed and it's returned in A as well. So that's what that does. Now, when we want to start playing a, a file, we have a couple of things we need to do. So the first thing is we need to initialize the Chibi Sound Pro driver. That's the platform specific driver. Some systems don't need that, but others do. We then need to load in the address of the song data into the song base uh, value in memory. Now I'm using this Z LD HL2 command here. This is just the equivalent of LD open brackets, song base, close brackets, comma HL, but the um, Game Boy doesn't have that function. So that's a macro to simulate that on the Game Boy and do it directly on the other systems. So that's loading song data into the address of song base. And then we run start song, which initializes the song for the first time. Um, everything else is then done by the um, interrupt handler, or in this case, it's a very crude loop. Where is it? So we've just got a crude loop here and we just run Chibi Tracks Play over and over again and that will update the music as required. So that is um, what we need to do. And what we're going to look at today is this start song routine. And you can see it, where is it? Just here. So this is going to set the song up for the first time. So what we're doing here first is we're going to reset the um, sound channel data. So we've got the channel data state zero, that's pointing to the first of the sound channels here. And we've got the total number of bytes here. And what we're doing here first is we're writing zeros to all of those bytes in that in all of the channels. So everything is starting as zero. Now, there's a couple of things we need to do to correct that, though, because otherwise it wouldn't play properly. Firstly, we need to point the instruments to a valid instrument. And we have a defined silent instrument to do that. But we'll do that in a moment. We need to point the pattern data to something as well. And we'll do that in a moment as well. The other thing we need to do, though, is we need to set the channel numbers to a valid value. Now, the channel number is offset by two and so what we're doing here is we are incrementing HL twice to move to the line afterwards and so this is this is offset to two in our channel data and then what we're going to do is we're going to load the channel numbers into that offset position um, and we're going to do that for the three channels and we're working backwards because of the position that HL has ended up at the end of this wiping routine we're now after the last channel so we're moving back to the second channel we're writing the value two, we're moving back to the first channel, where we're decreasing HL and writing the value one, and then we're moving back to channel zero and we're writing the value zero. And that's setting up the channel numbers. And if we didn't do that, all the music would play back on channel zero, whichever of these memory channels we were in, we would always end up writing back to hardware channel zero, and that would mean our music would get very, very messed up quite probably. So that's what we're doing there. Now, um, before we do that anymore, let's just have a quick look at the silent instrument. Now, the silent instrument, you can see, is just an empty instrument. It doesn't do anything at all. And this is just a piece of dummy data, if you will, so that there is a valid thing that we can start the instrument, the playing instrument to that will be recognized by the rest of the code. So when the music starts, we, we point the playing instrument to that, and that will appease the um, music playing code so that it, it doesn't do anything crazy and start playing random noises, which would be quite unpleasant. So that's what that does. Now, start song, song again. This will be run at the first time, and that will start with uh, pattern zero in the um, sequence. But on a repeat, uh, the second time the music plays, we might jump to a different position. Maybe we've got an introduction that only plays once, and the rest of the song jumps back to, say, pattern three. And so the accumulator will be loaded to the offset of the pattern we want to play 
next time and but the first time we want to start from pattern zero in within the sequence so that's why the accumulator is being pushed here and it's being loaded with zero for the first time what we're going to do now though is we're going to initialize all of our settings for the song so what we're doing here is we are loading in the address of the song into hl here and we're loading in the first byte in the song now that means we're going to be loading in this data here and the first byte is channels the second byte is the repeat point the third byte is the song speed, the fourth bytes and fourth and fifth bytes are the song address, sixth and seventh are pattern list, and eighth and nine are instrument list, and then we have the sequences. These are the lists of patterns that make up our song. So that's what we're going to be dealing with here. So the first thing we're doing here is we're loading in a byte and we're defining that as the number of song channels. Should always be three on the current player. The current player hasn't been designed or tested to work with more, but I might make it do so later if I had a need. So um, it, it's always three at the moment, but we are loading that in. We are then storing that in B for later. We're then loading in the repeat point here. That's the next byte. And we're storing that in repeat point here. That will be used when the song ends so that we know what pattern number to jump back to. So A is zero here, but it will be whatever value is in repeat point next time the song plays. Now, if allow speed change has been set, what we're doing next is we are loading in the song speed. So that will be used to alter the speed of the playing patterns if that is a possibility. Equally, if allow relocation is enabled, we are loading in the address that the song was compiled to, which um, in the case of this assembly is just my song. But if this was a binary file and it was exported for memory just 1000, that would be what is in the HL pair here. But what if we're playing back from 2000? Well, what we're doing here is we're calculating the difference between those two and storing it in song offset so we can correct all of the other addresses later on. The addresses being these pointers here to the pattern list, the instrument list, and the sequences, because those will be different if the song isn't being loaded to the address that it was compiled to. So that's what we're doing with that. We're starting up that calculation and then we're moving and we're getting what is basically the pattern list. And you can see here the first time, well, that, that pattern list needs to be recalculated if the song's being loaded to an alternate to a memory address. So that is what we're doing there. And we're loading the final pattern list once we've done that calculation into the pattern list address here. We're then loading in the instrument list, which is the list of all the possible instruments that can be played, of course. And then once we've done that, we've now got all of the data for the from the header, except for the offsets to the sequences. And you can see those three here. And those are the lists of patterns that we will, will be able to play. So we're going to initialize those now. And we need to do this once for each of the channels. So you can see we're using BC, uh, we're using B here as the count of the number of channels. So we will be always doing three in this case. So what we're doing here is we're repeatedly running in its song sequence, and then we're moving by the length of one channel, so 16 bytes. So IX is being pointed to each of the channels from zero, one, and two. And in its song sequence is going to use the accumulator to define the offset within that sequence list to play the current correct pattern. So that's what this routine is doing here. So what it's going to do is it's basically going to read in one of the sequence entries. So my song sequence zero for channel zero, for example, that's this. And then it's going to calculate the offset. So offset zero is here, but th this would be offset three. And so we're going to calculate the offset for the pattern we want to play. So we're loading in the, the address of the sequence here. We are then adding the offset from the accumulator. And if needed, we are calculating the offset of the song, because remember the song might be loaded into the wrong memory address. That's what that's doing there if needed. And then once we've done that, we are then going to process that pattern number with this get next, se next sequence. And that will calculate the information from the pattern and, and process it. So what we're going to do then is we're going to load the pattern address for the next line of the pattern here. We're doing that there from H and L. We're then setting the instrument to the silent instrument, which remember is completely empty. And we're setting the instrument time to one. Now the next tick that will go down by one and that will process and see what the instrument needs to do. And the instrument is actually just telling the system to stop. So that is, that's what that's doing, but it's important it had some valid data there. And so we're just loading in that valid instrument there into the instrument address of the playing of the current channel. And um, what we're doing then is we're returning. So of course we're doing this three times until we've finished. And once we've done that, we're then just returning back to the calling routine. So nothing happens then until the next interrupt. So the remainder of the work is being done by this get next sequence routine. 
Now you'll see that also coincidentally this this is following in from pattern end. When a pattern ends, we are loading in the address of the current playing sequence here. But get next sequence, it basically is designed to read in a pattern number. It's checking if that pattern is 255. If the pattern 255 is found, the song has ended. You will um, see in the um, song, each of the um, sequences ends in a 255. That's an end of sequence command basically. So you can't have you can only have up to 255 patterns, you can't have 256 because you can have a pattern zero, but you can't have a pattern 255. So what we're going to do then, um, there's some debug code there just so I can see what's going on, but that isn't typically used, is we are basically loading it. We're increasing the address of the sequence. We've loaded in the sequence number into A here, and then we're storing the new sequence address in the current running sequence playing sequence for the current channel. IX is pointing to the current channel. So we're loading the address for next time. We are then multiplying the pattern number by two here. And then we're adding that as an offset to the pattern list. And we're loading in the pattern address here. And we're setting the pattern play time to one, which means next ticket will update. Now, when we're returning here, um, the pattern address is being loaded into HL. I've actually just noticed something. I said you could have 256 patterns, but as it currently stands, um, the way I'm doing this um, multiplication by two, you would be limited to 127 because I'm only doing a one byte multiply. Uh, we could change that to a two byte, uh, but it would take a little bit extra memory. But as I say, at the moment, it's only 128. I'm not sure that's really going to limit you too much. But anyway, that's um, basically how we are loading in the data from the header and playing the song. Now, the final thing we're going to look at today is the restart song command. Now, this is used when the song has ended. You can see here we're jumping there to restart song. Now, you can see we've got a couple of pop commands here, and that's because um, we're actually having to break out a bunch of nested loops when the song restarts. So uh, we're, we're nested in various subroutines, and so to clear down the stack back to the default, we have to do three pops to forcibly remove those subroutines off the stack. We're then loading in the address from repeat point into the accumulator, and we're running start song again. And you will remember I said before, that um, the first time we run start song, we set the accumulator to zero, but the second time and every other time it's set to the repeat point so that the channel, the, so that the sequence being played is offset by whatever the repeat point is set to. So there we go. So that's all we're covering today. We're gonna to go into more detail next time. If you've liked what you've seen, please like and subscribe. If you're interested in this music thing, if you want to see me do more work on uh, Chibi Tracker Pro, please consider backing me on Patreon because um, this isn't something that's massively interesting to me. Uh, I'm no musician by any stretch of the imagination. And um, if I'm writing Windows software, I'm not writing tutorials. So I don't really gain any YouTube views or anything on it and I don't sell any books from it. So if you want to see me work more on that, please consider backing me because it's the only way I can justify keeping doing it. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Go to the website, download all the source code, the build scripts and the Chibi Tracker the Pro and Chibi Sound, all that stuff. It's all free, open source, you want to do with it, whatever you want. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.